Hello there friends and welcome for today's Pathfinder Enhanced Guide we have all of the best items in the entire game, that's right, and we'll be doing it chapter by chapter, all item types will be covered, including weapons, armor, and of course all accessories and usable items too. We have a lot of ground to cover and I'll also try my best at explaining the proper locations. Some of them will say threshold here, that's because I spawned them in game, as I don't have every single item on all every single character file, right? So let us get started on the best items in Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous, chapter by chapter. The first item is of course Radiance, which is Wrath of the Righteous, Holy Avenger. This is a very special long sword that can only be acquired at the prologue. It's not that it's the best weapon in the game or anything, not really, but it's certainly one of the most unique ones because you get some quests to upgrade it from its lowly unenchanted version when you first find it to the ultimate holy avenger. In my long swords guide I already explained how to upgrade radiance, so now let's just cover what this weapon does in its fully upgraded version. First, it's a plus 6 weapon, something very rare, I can't think of any other plus 6 weapon in the game, although the trickster mythic path can make any plus 5 weapon into plus 6. Cold Iron is nice, she penetrates demons' physical resistance to damage. It also has one of the best properties for damage, Holy, which means extra irresistible damage on every attack against evil creatures, pretty much everything you fight. And if wielded by a good aligned mythic creature or a paladin, it will become a Holy Avenger for, well, some minor bonuses to be fair. The spell resistance granted to all party members doesn't really cut it for when you get this at chapter 5. And you get to use the Greater Dispel Magic spell at will as a standard action though, so you can't really do much in the same round. Unfortunately, you can only use the Area Dispel, which is awful because it only targets a single buff effect from the enemy, not really worth it. As I said, it's not really the best weapon in the game, but certainly the most unique one, outside of Finium. For the second very useful prologue item we have the Marching Terror Glaive. You'll always have this because it's simply acquired by defeating the first story boss of the game. Now this glaive is quite stacked for when you get it, it's plus one, and whenever it lands a hit on a new enemy for the first time, they'll take 1d6 points of negative energy damage, quite good, plus all other enemies in a 15 foot area must pass a will saving throw of DC 17, quite respectable for the early game, or become frightened for one round, meaning they'll run away from you. Even early game, if you are playing on core or above, you'll fight lots of enemies per chapter because of the increased spawn numbers. And of course, early you won't have many ways of crowd controlling targets, so this glaive is even better because it's once per new enemy, right? It's not just once per round or once per battle. As a glaive, it's also a rich weapon which means your characters, especially two-handers and other characters that don't have high armor class, can attack even at melee range, while remaining safe behind your tanks. Well alright, now let's cover the best chapter 1 items, starting with Finian. It can actually become any weapon type your character is proficient in, and just like Radiance, it also becomes stronger as you progress through the game and do Finian's quest. And by the way, I also have a guide on how to upgrade Finian, you can check here. Let's first cover how to actually use Finian. So, once you get him at the very first quest in the game during chapter 1, the place where Wojif sends you, be sure to talk with Wojif at the tavern basement first. Well, you'll get this option here at the right lower corner of the inventory screen called Finian, so just click on it. Now click on this step here and you'll be able to select what weapon to turn Finian into, it doesn't have to be the main character, it can be any party member, but only one character can have Finian at the same time. The more weapons your character can wield, the more options you have. My Demon Barbarian here is focused into scimitars, so let's choose it. Now be sure to either double click on this icon here, or drag and drop to equip Finian into any of your weapon slots. By default, even the lowliest version of Finian at chapter 1 is already quite decent. It's a plus 1, cold iron weapon to bypass demons physical resistance to damage, also has the very handy ghost touch property, which means you can fully hit incorporeal creatures including the shadow demon boss at chapter 1, and also the annoying shadows at the marketplace. 
but of course the best part is how versatile he is, as you can use him to replace weapons that aren't that common in the game, like let's say, star knives, <laughs> tridents, throwing axes. Early on you'll be quite starved for weapons. Don't forget Finan can also become ranged weapons like crossbows and bows. Now Finan's first upgrade comes at chapter 3. He will become plus 3 and also a heart seeker weapon. Before he used to be stronger, right, because he also got brilliant energy, but that was nerfed. So now it's only Heart Seeker for the first upgrade. Heart Seeker lets you bypass any concealment against most enemies, which is also quite the great ability to have. As far as Finian Ultimate version at chapter 5, he'll finally get brilliant energy at last, which is one of the most powerful properties any weapon could have. It lets you ignore quite a massive amount of armor class per hit, against even the toughest of enemies, especially on Unfair. Bosses like Playful Darkness, for example, who is the ultimate secret boss, can lose up to around 9 armor class by just having a brilliant energy weapon, so getting an upgrading Finion is definitely worth it. Now for a second great chapter 1 weapon we have the Wicked Longbow. It's quite unique in that it's a plus 2 weapon for how early you can get it at least. Also Composite, which is great for getting higher damage from your strength modifier. The secondary property isn't really that good, because it only works on a critical hits in early game, your bows, well, they won't have high critical, but anyways, if you get a critical hit, the enemy has to pass a will save intro, or become cursed. It's a minor curse effect, though, just a minus one penalty to will, two to fortitude, and minus three to reflex, not as good as reducing attack bonus and stats. You can get it at the marketplace, at one of the north houses there. For the last amazing chapter 1 weapon we have the Abrupt Force Scimitar. Scimitars are, by default, one of the best weapon types in the game. Pretty much the best one-handed weapon outside of Kukri's for dual wielding, because they have the highest critical range of them all. And this particular scimitar is already called Iron, and has quite the handy debuffing property. Once per round, whenever it lands a hit on an enemy, the target must pass a fortitude saving throw, the DC isn't really that high, or become stunned for one round. Stun is one of the best forms of crowd control because the enemy can't really do anything. As I said, the DC isn't really that high, but it can work every now and then, especially for playing on core and below. <laughs> especially for when you first get it at chapter 1. And it can be looted from the Brimorak optional encounter at the marketplace. A lot of the powerful stuff from chapter 1 is at the marketplace. <laughs> You have many optional encounters there. Just be prepared because they can be quite tough if you don't know what you're doing. And I also already have a guide on how to deal with even the toughest chapter 1 encounters on Unfair that you can check here. Now let's cover armors and everything else for the best chapter 1 items. First with Lady Calandra's chain shirt. This is probably the first mithril armor you'll find in the game. Even better because it's a chain shirt. Mithra will reduce the armor penalty, the arcane spell failure chance, and also increase the max dexterity bonus from whatever armor it's on. The last property, the dexterity bonus increase, is the best one for higher AC. The fact it's on a chain shirt, which is already the best light armor, is even better, because your dexterity based characters can fully benefit from this even early, and this is found at the Tower of Astrod. For a second great armor we have the Living Ram Breastplate. This has the very unique property of enhancing your character's charge. Whenever they charge and hit an enemy they'll deal an additional 1 to 6 points of bludgeoning damage, which is fine for the early game, and even get to knock the enemy down through a 17 reflex saving throw. Also decent for the early game. Enemies that are prone, well, they can't really do anything. They'll also take a massive minus 4 penalty to AC, and whenever they finally get up, they'll proc attacks of opportunity from nearby party members, so they're basically toast. Don't forget, charging is one of the easiest ways of alpha striking the enemy, even outside of battle, and shifting the encounter into your favor. You can buy the Living Ram armor from the Dwarf Merchant outside the tavern. Now, for one of the best rings in Chapter 1, even the whole game too, we have the Icy Protector. It grants you 10 cold resistance, which is fine, but... If your character has the Ice Plant hack, so is either a Shaman or a Witch, it will also grant them a plus 2 natural bonus to AC. This is a very special type of bonus because it will stack with everything else, including 
all other sources of natural bonuses. So if your character wants to be tanky, especially early game, consider buying this ring. You can get it from the Cleric Merchant at the Tavern during Chapter 1. As I said, it's so good for tanking that it will last you through the whole game. There's also the Amulet of Devouring, which can be looted from the very special Nabasu Demon Encounter at the Marketplace. So I imagine most players end up missing on it, because you can only find it after you defend the Tavern. Anyways, whenever the wearer of this amulet lands a killing blow with a natural attack, they'll gain temporary hit points equal to their character level for 1 minute, so this can result in even up to plus 20. Temporary hit points are an amazing secondary layer of defense too. Of course, because it requires you to rely on natural attacks. Ideally, you want to equip this on either pets or, of course, the newly released Shifter class. For an amazing Chapter 1 item, we have the Signet of House Vespertilio. This is another one of those items that's so good, it will last you through the whole game, from as early as you find it. Once per rest, you can use it to enhance any skill of any ally, by a very rare and quite big plus 5 circumstance bonus. Because of how versatile it is, after all you can increase any skill you want, and the fact circumstance bonuses to skills are extremely rare, trust me, this item is something you want as early as possible. Just like most powerful Chapter 1 items, it's also at the marketplace. For the last great Chapter 1 items, we have lesser extent meta magic rods. They aren't exactly necessary, but if you plan on properly buffing party members, you'll want them as early as possible too. Lesser extent rods only work with level 1 to level 3 spells, which is fine because level 1 to level 3 buffs are some of the best ones in the game anyways. And this rod can double the duration of any of these spells 3 times per rest. The main reason I'm choosing it so early in the game is that, well, early game is when your characters will have low caster level, which means low duration for your spells. With this rod you can overcome that, something like bow strength, let's imagine Darren was level 4, would last 8 whole minutes, which is way better than just 4 for the early dungeons. And of course, the fact this rod can be used with the haste spell even later in the game makes it a must-have. It might be a bit expensive early, but it's quite the nice investment, and I'm pretty sure you can also buy them from the tavern merchants. Well, alright, now let us cover the best Chapter 2 items, starting with the best of them all and actually one of the ultimate items in the whole game. The Covenant of the Inheritor Storyteller Relic. When equipped into one of your quick slots, this item will automatically grant your character a very big aura, 30 foot, enough to hit all party members easily. Any ally inside the aura will be granted first, a very nice plus 2 bonus to caster level checks to penetrate spell resistance. But most importantly, all of their weapons will become good aligned and also count as if made of cold iron. If you've already played Wrath, then you know all the demon enemies the most common type in the game, even the weakest of them all, do have damage reduction against cold iron or good. Which means, if your weapons are not of these types, you will deal reduced damage in melee. With the Covenant, you can easily bypass that, especially because it will work for any weapon, including pets or natural attacks, let's say if you are a shifter or polymorphed into an animal form. Everything will work. Ranged attacks too. To get it, you need to first find the melted shard of a ring at the burning house in the marketplace during chapter 1, the same place you fight the optional Brimorak demon. Now I know we are talking about chapter 2 and that's because while you can find this at chapter 1, you can only turn it into an actual usable item during chapter 2, the earliest. Be sure to talk with the storyteller as soon as you enter chapter 2 and exit your tent, because if you don't do it right there to craft this item, the storyteller will only return during chapter 3, and this is so good that you want it as early as possible. Now let us cover some good Chapter 2 weapons, starting with the Falchion Jinx. Falchions are another amazing weapon type, because they also have great critical range. This plus 2 Cold Iron Falchion has the very unique property of essentially granting you an extra attack whenever you attack a creature that is under any hex effect. So ideally, you want to combine it with, let's say, Camellia or also Amber the Witch, both can debuff the enemies easily with Evil Eye, for example. 
The extra damage can really add up because it's going to be your full weapon damage. For example, if I were to equip it with my Kitsune who doesn't have anything boosting falchions, it would be another 100 damage or so per attack. You can buy Jinx from Wilser Garms, the merchant, at chapter 2 or 3 plus. The Blade of Order is another nice choice too. It's a scimitar, a top tier weapon and whenever it lands a hit on a creature that is chaotic evil, all demons are, it will apply a stacking minus one penalty to that creature's damage rolls until the end of combat and it does stack up to minus five for a very big damage reduction. And the best part is it doesn't offer a save, right? So long as it hits, that's enough to proc the debuff. Blade of Order is also bought from Wilser Garms. Now let's cover some nice armors, starting with Carapace. Just like Lady Calandra's chain shirt, this is going to be, without a doubt, the first Mithril full plate you find in the game, by defeating Joran Vane at the end of chapter 2. So if you want your heavy armor characters to have the best AC, be sure to go with a Mithril full plate. And speaking about Mithril, we have yet another amazing Mithril armor in chapter 2, the Chainmail of Comradery, which is, by the way, the ultimate armor choice for any character that is going to melee and doesn't really care about AC. Because whenever the wearer is flanking an enemy, and flanking is super easy to do in Wrath of the Righteous, you don't have to be attacking the enemy from opposite sides. So long as two characters are attacking the enemy, that's enough for flanking. Well, you deal an additional 2 points of damage, which will become doubled to plus 4 if you have the outflank feat. And well, outflank is one of the ultimate melee feats. If you are following my builds, then all of your melee characters will have outflank as early as you can. An extra plus 4 damage per hit can help a lot, especially if you are dual wielding because it's then applied to all of your weapon attacks. Of course, if you are dexterity based and focus into tanking, you probably don't want this armor, because as you can see here, it will tank your armor class value, regardless of being mithril. At least for the mid to late game, when you start stacking dexterity to the max. You can find it in the underground hideout area. If it's not on your map, it's because you missed the perception check to detect it, so just level up your characters and try again. Now let's cover accessories for Chapter 2, starting with one of my favorites, the Hat of Heartening Song. This hat really only works for Skulls or Bards. And well, if you've watched my guys, then you know how powerful Skulls can be, no matter your party. Essentially, whenever the character uses any song, the song will also empower all party members with regeneration. When you first find the hat, it's going to be two increasing from there onwards. You might say, well, it's just two points of regeneration, yes, but it's party-wide and also per round, so great at automatically restoring small amounts of damage your characters end up taking anyways, without having to rely on potions, especially because bards and skulls can and should acquire the lingering performance feat as early as possible, and this will triple the duration of your bard's songs per use, so just one use of the song will equal to, at the very least, 6 points healed for all party members. Not counting the increases as you level up, of course. The Hat of Heartening Song can be found as Scylla's personal quest during Chapter 2 at the Houndheart campsite. Pretty early, too. Bookworm's Headband is another great choice. It does grant you a plus 2 to intelligence, which is great for intelligent casters, but most importantly, it makes you immune to all compulsion effects, Almost all sources of crowd control, at least the ones that confuse, charm or dominate your character, well, they are compulsion. And getting confused is extremely annoying, especially because of many enemies that spam party-wide confusion effects, like, for example, the Vescavore Swarms. With this headband, at the very least one party member will become fully immune to their very annoying Jibber passive ability. Now, it does also apply a penalty to Charisma and Persuasion, but honestly, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> Ideally, you're probably using this on melee characters because you don't want them getting confused and attacking your own allies. You can get Bookworm's Headband from the Cleric Merchant at Chapter 2, inside your campsite. Expensive, but certainly worth the price. Be sure to get it before the Leper Smile area to handle the Vescavore Swarms. Now, for an amazing ring and one of the best ones in the game, we have Red Salamander. This can only work with spontaneous casters, that is, oracles, 
Amber as a stigmatized witch, also sorcerers. It won't work on, let's say, wizards, clerics, or shamans, because they are prepared casters instead. Anyways, this ring will grant your spontaneous casters, no matter their class, a lot of the most powerful fire spells for free. We have Fireball, Hellfire Ray, the ultimate single target damage, even Fiery Body, one of the best buffs in the whole game. They'll all be automatically added to your spellbook, so long as you have the ring equipped. And here's the best part. If you apply meta magic to the spell gained from the ring, Heighten, for example, is enough, doesn't really matter what meta magic you do, the meta magic version of the spell will remain on your spellbook forever, even if you want to equip the ring. This is even better with the heightened meta magic feat, which by the way is already one of the best meta magic of them all, because it doesn't cost anything. For example, Hellfire Ray is a level 6 spell. I can use heightened to have it remain as a level 6 spell, but heightened. This way you can easily keep any of the spells granted by this ring, while also giving it to another character, or not, it's up to you. You can buy the Red Salamander Ring from either the Cleric Merchant at Chapter 2 or 3. Draven's Hat is a pretty nice helmet for wizards. If you grant the wearer a very rare plus 2 profane bonus shoe intelligence. Now the best part is whenever you cast a slow or haste spell, it will become automatically quickened. Because of how useful haste can be, let's say if your characters get ambushed in the world map, you can immediately quicken it for free and then cast another spell at the same round. Amazing for ambushes. Also, once per day, it can make any spell you want quickened. Quicken is another very useful meta magic, so even better. Now, there is a limitation to this hat. It can only be worn by non-good characters. Well, most of the party members, the spellcasters, that is, well, they aren't good align except Ember. Nano at the very least isn't. It's also one of the few classic pointy wizard hats in the game, so if you want your characters to go for that aesthetic, especially now that you can change the looks of your armors into something else, be sure to get it. Getting it, however, can be a bit tricky. It's found inside Darren's mansion, which you can access at chapter 2 for his quest, but it has a very high perception check. So if you haven't found it, it's probably because you missed the perception check. So just return later after leveling up to Darren's mansion. Now for the last great chapter 2 item we have, the Triceratops statuette, found at the end of chapter 2 during the Dresden Siege. This is essentially the easiest way of giving your character an animal companion for free. Assuming you aren't a class that has one, let's choose my squad here for example, all my other party members have pets. You just equip it on a quick slot, We should move. then activate the item, and there we go. We now have Bismuth, the friendly Triceratops, as our pet. Now it has low stats here because it's completely unbuffed, but it can become quite decent, so long as you buff it, of course. Remember that the Triceratops, just like the dog, the wolf, and the boar, it does automatically trip enemies on its gore attacks. So it's great for crowd control too. The only major limitation is it will scale at your character's level minus 4. Of course, if you are a legend, it will eventually become level 20. And yes, you can mount Bismuth too. Now let us cover the chapter 3 items, and well, this is when the truly OP items really start appearing, that is, the items that are so good, they will remain with you until the end of the game. And of course, I have to start with the most broken ring of them all. The Bane of Spirit, the true one ring. This ring has multiple effects. The first one is decent enough, whenever you equip it on a character, they will gain a huge plus 4 bonus to saving throws against mind affecting effects. Great so you don't get crowd control with let's say confusion. Well, you also take a minus 2 penalty against poison and some other effects, they don't matter because you can easily become immune to them all. Now here is the best part. As a free action, and free actions by the way are unlimited, without a cost, you can lose hit points equal to half your level to grant a target creature a plus 2 bonus to attack rolls, untyped by the way, so stacks with everything else, and, wait for it, transform their damage type into force for one round. Force is unique because it is pretty much irresistible. Nothing in the game will resist force damage outside of angels. That is the main character, not the angel enemies. So with this ring, you can easily bypass any damage reduction the enemy might have, you can even use it for spells, it's not just physical damage. You might think it's not much, but trust me, it really is 
a massive power up to your characters. Because once again, the way this ring works is it doesn't just affect the equipped character, right? You equip this on anyone and then you can apply the secondary strongest effect on any party member. For example, let's say you are playing on turn-based. Because the game is essentially frozen, right? Other characters cannot act while it's your turn. You can simply apply this ring on all party members. Once again, it's a free action, right? Let's just keep doing it. So that your whole party will have irresistible damage for one round. The hit point cost... Well, Angels, like I said, can actually avoid most of it because of the Solar Winds Halo ability. As far as other mythic paths, at most you'll be losing 10 damage, which honestly is nothing because of how easy it is to heal damage by chapter 3, either through spells or Cleric and Paladin's channel energy too. Well, for party wild healing. On the other hand, if you're playing on real time with pause, there's also a very easy way of using this ring, just activate it on one character, then press the letter V on your keyboard to pause and automatically unpause the game very fast. This way you can also use it on all party members without wasting actions or turns. Like I said, it's a free action, right? You can use this and still retain your movement, your attacks, your spells, everything. Because it's instantly activated, you don't even have to prep buff with it, you can do it during battle. At the hit of it even, even like right before attacking the enemy, you can use this ring. That's what makes it so OP. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised it was never nerfed, but anyways, let's hope it remains this way. Like I said, all of your damage, no matter what type it was before, no matter if it's a secondary effect, everything will be fully converted into force, irresistible. Now, the Bane of Spirit ring comes from a crusade relic, the Phylactery of Stevanus the Rotten. You can find it even as early as chapter 2, but you can only turn it into the actual usable ring at chapter 3. If you're wondering about crusade relics and how to do it, I already have a guide completely focused on them. The same for Storyteller Relics, so please be sure to check them out if you want in-depth explanations. Anyways, get this ring as early as you can, and keep it forever on your characters. For another extremely powerful Chapter 3 item, we have the Plague of Madness Quarter Staff. And this is the best staff in the game for blaster casters, that is. Casters that want to deal damage instead of crowd control or buffs and debuffs. The Plague Staff has an extremely unique property. Whenever you cast the same spell three times in a row, your next spell will become both empowered and also maximized at the same time, for the highest spell damage boost possible. You might think it's gimmicky or hard to get this effect going, actually it's super easy and here's how you should do it. Just equip the staff. Now we have to cast the same three spell three times in a row, right? Well, the good thing is we have infinite use cantrips available for us, right? So just cast any of them three times in a row, like resistance or virtue, it doesn't really matter. Just cast them three times in a row and that's it. This will be enough to proc the quarter staff's effect. The best part is after casting the same spell three times in a row, you can even change this quarter staff into something else and still retain the benefit. Of course, after unleashing, the boosted spell, you'll have to do it again. Which is why I say it's most likely going to be once per battle, but look, having our strongest spell automatically maximized and empowered even once per battle is more than enough to, well, either destroy all the enemies or severely reduce their strength. As a matter of fact, the closest item we have that can do something similar has a limitation of three times per day and is super late game at chapter five only. Getting it is simple too, it comes from a crusade relic, just like the Bane of Spirit Ring. In this case, the Wicked Dope. Yes, it is called that. And speaking about overpowered, of course we can't forget the best weapon in the game. The Gravesinger X. It is simply the weapon that combines the highest critical damage multiplier together with the highest critical range. So it not only hits the hardest, but also has criticals more often, all in the same package. Usually the weapons with the highest critical range, like scimitars, falchions and four shards, they tend to have lower critical damage, not Grave Singer, however. While its other properties aren't really anything special, remember you can always buff it to the max, with spells and such. 
The Grave Singer can actually become any type of axe, Great Axe, Hand Axe or Battle Axes, but Great Axes have the highest base damage. And if you choose to equip it while two-handed or one-handed without another off-hand weapon, you also get the highest bonus from power attack. The Grave Singer is yet another Crusade Relic, this time coming from the unholy symbol of Rovagug item. The Death's Consonant Bardish can also help your spellcasters, it's actually the best weapon for a fighter mage sort of character that wants to focus on intelligence, because it has the very unique property of having both your attack rolls and also damage bonuses scale from intelligence instead of strength. It's also a rich weapon by default, which is great for spellcasters as you don't have to stand directly next to the enemy at danger of getting hit. This weapon is yet another Crusade Relic, this time from the last branch of Ash item. Speaking about Great Caster weapons, at Chapter 3 you can also find the Quarter Staff of the War Mage, which is the ultimate staff for boosting the DC of your spells. This will increase them by a plus 2 no matter the spell school, together with also a very nice plus 4 bonus to spell penetration checks, and even a plus 5 to use magic device. You can get it inside the Ivory Sanctum. Remember that you can combine this with the Plague of Madness Quarter Staff, after all, as soon as you finish casting the three spells required for Plague of Madness, simply switch to War Mage for the DC boost. For another very powerful weapon, we have the Ever Cold Heavy Crossbow. This is most likely the best crossbow in the entire game, as it has the very unique property of firing two bolts at once whenever you perform your first attack during a round, kinda like the many shot feat except that only works for bows. Which is why I imagine they decided to include this heavy crossbow in the game. It also has a debuffing property with a somewhat decent 25 DC, and as always, despite the fact it's just a plus one heavy crossbow by default, remember you can add way more properties to buffs and class abilities. For the ultimate crossbow sniper in the game, and by the way, I already have a build just for that. Evercode comes from the Treasure of the Midnight Isles DLC, at the first set of islands. Now it's time to cover the best offhand weapon in the game. The Hasty Eradicator Dagger. This dagger can actually increase the number of your offhand attacks by an entire plus two. It doesn't stack with haste, but it doesn't matter, because haste is just a plus one attack, and by the way, Speed weapons and the haste effect, well, they only increase your main hand attacks per round, not the off hand. For example, if I equip my character with this dagger, despite the fact I'm not spacked into dual wielding, notice that I still got three off hand attacks, one by default and two extra from the dagger. Of course, you can achieve an extra plus two from the two weapon fighting feats, for a total of five off hand attacks. Ideally, because you don't have the feats to spare to specialize into multiple critical weapon types, you would then dual wield two daggers, right? So that your feats would apply to both weapons. Of course, you can also go with Kukris, they have higher critical range than daggers, it's just that they won't have something as useful as Hasty Eradicator. And by the way, you can get this from Raju's first personal quest during Chapter 3 at the Hell Knight's Outpost, kinda early too. Now, as far as useful armors, we have Web Strider. It has the very rare property of granting you a plus two morale bonus to dexterity. Essentially, it's going to be a plus two to dexterity that will stack with all other sorts of bonuses. It's sadly a padded armor, which means you won't have really high maximum dexterity for armor class purposes. Eventually, you end up with more as a dexterity focused character. On the other hand, it's perfect for ranged characters or other dexterity party members that, well, don't care about AC, because for example they have reach. You can also double this bonus to plus 4 with a special item I'll mention later. This is once again a crusade relic, this time from the Altar of the First Retriever. And speaking about relics, let us cover the Ring of Summoning. It does have a summon monster ability, which isn't really the best part. Here's what really matters. All allies, including the wearer, within a 30 feet aura, we'll get a very nice plus 2 bonus to both weapon damage and also saving throws against chaotic creatures. Every enemy that matters in this game is chaotic, 
including for the first DLC where you meet some chaotic neutral enemies instead of chaotic evil. Because the bonus from this aura is untyped, it will also stack with all other sorts of different bonuses. Now, while the relic for the Ring of Summoning is found at Chapter 2 at the Hound Heart campsite, which you went to anyways for the Hat of Heartening Song, you can only truly craft it starting from Chapter 3, which is why it's here. For more powerful rings, we have the Clemency of Shadows. This also works as a huge aura, which empowers all your party members first with an additional Attack of Opportunity per round. If you've watched some of my guards, then you know Attacks of Opportunity are the way to easily destroy enemies. Plus, if any Attack of Opportunity is a critical hit, something very easy with high critical range weapons, the enemy will be automatically staggered without a save, no resistance whatsoever, unless they are immune to it, which is rare. Staggered is a great debuff because it reduces the amount of actions the enemy can take per round, both attacks and spellcasting. Lastly, it also has a very fun and quite cheesy special ability if any of your party members, including summons, falls unconscious or dies, a giant spider will be summoned to fight alongside you. And here's the best part. If the spiders summoned from this ring themselves die, which is easy because they aren't really that strong, well, it will summon more spiders. So essentially, you get an army of spiders. It's really hilarious to see because the spiders will never stop spawning. So if you want to be a spider mancer, be sure to grab this ring. This is actually a crusade relic that comes from the Stone of Ghostly Pathways item, also found during Chapter 3 Plus. Now the Great Rings don't stop coming in Chapter 3. We also have Marty's Testament. The wearer of the ring will become vulnerable to fire, which doesn't really matter because it's very easy to acquire immunity or damage resistance against fire. But anyways, you first get a very nice plus 4 bonus to will saving throws, but most importantly, immunity to mind-affecting conditions. Just like with the bookworm's headband I mentioned before, mind-affecting conditions are the worst crowd control effects the enemies cast on you, because you'll be left confused, which means you'll then hit your party members or dominate it for the same effect. Not to mention other effects that stun or paralyze you even. So be sure to equip this on low will characters like rogues and fighters. Of course, you can later just cast the Shield of Law spell for immunity to mind-affecting conditions against chaotic creatures, but that's way later. This is also a lifesaver against a certain Demon Lord battle on Chapter 4 where you'll be debuffed, dispelled, and have to make a very high saving throw against a Paralyzed Aura. The Broken Trickster Glasses are amazing too. First, it provides your character with a nice plus 6 enhancement bonus to both Wisdom and Charisma, perfect for casters. But the second property makes it one of the ultimate tanking items in the game. Whenever you take any damage, really, no matter the source, your character will gain 20 damage reduction against that, including physical energy, even some rare types of damage like Holy and Unholy. Now, being able to shave 20 points of damage from whatever source is extremely powerful, especially for unfair, because the damage you take there is only doubled after it's been diminished by damage reduction. It just so happens that the characters that have the highest AC also want charisma, so even better for you. You can get the Broken Trickster from the first Treasure of the Midnight Isles boss at the last island during the first set of islands. The old grimoire can really help spellcasters including casters that aren't full casters like, let's say, Scylla as a paladin, because it provides you with 3 extra spell slots for level 1 spells, 2 for 2, and also 2 for level 3. Characters like paladins have very useful level 1, 2, and 3 spells, such as Bestow Grace, Aura of Greater Courage, and of course, Bless Weapon and Divine Favor. So having extra casts of that is great. The same for rangers. But of course, you can use it on a full spellcaster like Darren, a wizard, or anything, for more castings of useful level 1 to 3 spells. The Old Grimoire is found inside the Ivory Sanctum. Chapter 3 doesn't really stop giving because we also have the Devouring Lust Metamagic Rod. First, it lets you automatically maximize any spell 6 times per day, that's double that of other rods. And whenever you rest, you recharge it. Once again, notice it applies to any spell from level 1 to level 9. Second, the damage will be 
change into unholy. Also great because enemies don't tend to resist unholy damage, even demons, even evil creatures. But of course we also have the Bane of Spirit Ring for that. Devouring Lust is crafted from the Attractive Impost Crusade Relic. For our last OP Storyteller Relic during Chapter 3 we have Ronex Sacrifice. This pair of boots is well the best feat slot for any dexterity based character. First it enhances your dexterity by a huge amount, plus 8. No other item in the game gives as much. It even doubles the bonuses from the haste spell to armor class, attack rolls and reflex saving throws. Grants a very nice bonus to both mobility and athletics and even has a debuffing effect. If the enemy confirms a critical hit against you, they'll become stunned for 1d4 rounds without a saving throw. It really is a very stacked item. Now to craft it, you need the rune-covered ancient leather scrap, which can be found at Winter Sun. It is true that, ideally, you should only be able to craft this item at chapter 4 or 5. I'm just showing it here because, well, it's missable, right? You have to complete the standing stone puzzles in Winter Sun. If you fail one of the lore checks to get the statues there, you will miss on this item. Which is why I'm covering it now, as I imagine most players will head to Winter Sun during Chapter 3 and initiate the puzzle. By the way, I also have a guide on how to complete the puzzle successfully if you need. Man, the great items from Chapter 3 don't stop coming, but we're close to the end now. Let's cover the Hat of the Bitter End. The ultimate head slot for most melee and ranged characters, that is, characters that don't want to bother casting spells outside of buffing. Whenever the wearer of the hat slays an enemy, they'll get a plus 2 stacking bonus to their attack rolls, also untyped, except this will stack not only with itself, but also everything else. It's for 3 rounds, so can last through multiple battles depending on how close the enemies are to one another. The hilarious part is there's no limit to the stacking amount, so you can easily stack it 5 or higher times even. It's another item found in the Treasure of the Midnight Isles DLC in the first set of islands. Now let's talk about the Fencer's Gift Gloves, actually the best in slot for both dual building and also two-handed characters, as they provide first a plus 3 damage bonus, both dual building and two-handed of course, but lastly, if you are a fighter that has the weapon training ability, it will also increase its bonus by plus 2, which is why my characters often end fighter at level 5 to get weapon training, so that we can then increase it even further through Fencer's Gift, while also getting even more damage bonuses. You can find Fencer's Gift at the Befouled Barrows during Chapter 3, or later if you prefer. Well, if you are a fire-based damage caster, don't forget the Ring of Pyromania from the Cleric Merchant at Dresden for even higher fire damage boosts, which by the way works wonders with spells like Hellfire Ray, because this is applied per spell tick, that is, per instance of damage. So if your spell fires multiple rays, dealing fire damage per round, they'll all get the damage boost. Last but not least, we have the Demonic Resentment Helmet, found at the Ivory Sanctum too. Whenever the wearer is under a rage effect, they'll get increased bonuses by plus one. It might not seem like much, but there aren't that many good melee-focused helmets in the game. Now at last, we can finally leave Chapter 3 and enter into the best Chapter 4 items. Starting with one of my favorites, the Robe of the Seven Sins, also known as the best robe in the whole game for spellcasters, unless you want more damage, as I'll show later on. First, it increases the caster level of all your spells by a massive plus 3 amount. Increases to caster level are great, well, first, to increase spell damage, second, to increase spell duration for buffing purposes, and lastly, for spell penetration too, so it's a complete package. Now this robe also increases the DC of all your spells by a plus 1, and even higher bonuses to spell penetration too, so essentially it's a plus 8 to spell penetration when you consider the caster level boost. It's especially useful for Merged Angel or Liches, because they have spells that don't have a cap, which means the higher your caster level, the higher the damage, even past level 20. Anyways, you can find these OP robes also at the Treasure of Midnight Isles DLC, but this time at the second set of islands that only become available at Chapter 4. Well, since we are talking about the Treasure DLC, we might as well cover 
one of the ultimate rings in the game. We really have a lot of nice rings. The Ring of Triumphant Advance. Same location as the Seven Sins Robe, so the second set of Isles. Now this ring will first give you a plus two deflection bonus to AC, who cares? The best part is here. Any morale bonuses you have will be doubled. It's especially useful for Azata characters in my case and Azata 2 Devil, because you have a spell that increases all of your physical and mental scores by morale bonuses. For example, we have first a plus four from the Believe in Yourself spell. It's then doubled through the Ring of Triumphant Advanced, which means Azatas can have even higher than plus eight to all their physical and mental scores. Anyways, even if you aren't an Azata, it's still the best thing slot for any melee or ranged character because morale bonuses are one of the easiest ways of increasing your saving throws, attack rolls, and also damage. Because of the heroism line of spells, especially Good Hope, and of course the ultimate version, Heroic Invocation, which grants all party members a plus 4 morale to both attack and damage, or plus 8 for the wearer of this ring. Now let's discover some nice chapter 4 weapons. First we have the Interceptor Rapier, also one of the best for this weapon type. First it grants a plus 2 damage and a B to attacks of opportunity. Second, if the attack of opportunity results in a killing blow, you can actually make one extra attack during the next round. You can buy it from Weirlong Black Mask, one of the chapter 4 merchants at the flash markets. Second, we have the Faith Bearer Scimitar found at one of the rotating platform puzzles at the upper city. First, it is holy, which, as I've explained before, is one of the best properties a weapon could have. But second, it can provide a lot of party-wide healing on hit. Because whenever you confirm a critical hit, like I said, scimitars have high critical range, you have to make a lore religion check of DC 40. And on a success, all the nearby allies will be healed for an amount of points equal to the number of ranks you have in lore, so a maximum of plus 20. Because of how often this happens, and the fact it's party-wide even, it's a must-have scimitar. Because the DC can be somewhat high, ideally your scimitar wielder should also get ranks into lore religion. Scylla is a perfect choice, but there's also Social if you want to get him martial weapons proficiency. Divine Dismissal is a pretty unique weapon too, you can buy it from Whirlong Black Mask, at the flash markets of course. Its special property, well, first it's holy, although Earthbreakers aren't the best weapon types. Anyways, you aren't really going to be using this weapon for attacking, rather it's special property. It lets you cast the Greater Dispel Magic spell at will as a wizard with a level equal to your character level, which by the way is uncapped, that is, this weapon is best in the hands of a legend, because they can acquire 40 character level, which means 40 caster level, double than that of almost any other, for a very easy way of dispelling enemies of their priceless buffs. Wouldn't bother using it with other characters, however. Go legend or don't bother with this. Now let's talk about some armors. First, Wandering Common. The best shirt for melee characters. You get bonuses to trickery and athletics, which is nice, but here's the best part. A plus two bonus to attack brawls for attacks of opportunity. Like I said, attacks of opportunity are very useful. So while the bonus might not seem like much, every bit helps. Especially because the other shirts or robes aren't really useful for non-spellcasters. Anyways, you can find the Wandering Command at the abandoned mansion area during Wojif's quest at chapter 4, if, and only if, you choose not to corrupt him. Paramakis of Divine Guidance are great as well, usually my spellcasters all wear this. First, because Haramakis won't interfere with spellcasting, and any character in the game can equip them just fine. Second, the bonus this provides you is quite good. A plus 4 sacred to all saving throws. Sacred bonuses are kinda rare, so this is amazing to have. You can buy it from Mojif during chapter 4. Now let's get into more fun accessories for chapter 4. Velaxia's amulet is of course one of the best amulets for most characters, ideally the main character. It's a plus 5 natural armor amulet, which is great because it's the maximum amount, outside of plus 6 amulets. But the best part is that you increase your highest score 
buy a further untyped plus 2. It doesn't need any saint to acquire this, you need to finish Valexia's quest during chapter 4. The display of power belt is another handy tool to have. It's a plus 6 belt of strength, but has the very unique property of granting the wearer a 15 foot aura that makes all enemies inside suffer a minus 2 penalty to will saving throws, without a save that is. They can't resist this, it will always work against any enemy. Perfect for combining with spellcasters that want to target will, like the ones with enchantment or illusion instant death spells. Because the aura isn't really the highest, ideally you want to slap this belt on a melee character because they will be close to the enemies anyways. Just buy it from a chapter 4 merchant. And when it comes to belts, we can't forget the ultimate tanking belt in the entire game, Lizard Tail. First, you'll get a huge plus 8 circumstance bonus to AC for the first round of combat. You might say, well, it's just the first round. Honestly, by the time you get this belt, battles will be over in just one round, even though unfair. And plus 8 is really good, because of the type, circumstance, quite rare. Second, the bonus will be even higher for characters that are a pet, or under a polymorph effect like a shifter, changed into a different form as they'll get a further permanent plus 3 morale bonus to armor class, also very rare, and reflect saving throws, so essentially pets and shifters can get plus 11 to their AC with this belt. What's not to love? You can buy this at the merchant at the 10,000 delights area during chapter 4. I believe after you complete a few of her quests, Herax, the NPC by the way, so dealing with Minago and all that, so that Herax becomes the new owner of the place. Now, of course, I also have to cover the Mythic Special Cloak, the Bound of Possibility. Every Mythic Path has a different cloak with a separate unique effect, although getting the cloak is the same for all paths. Now, while finding this can be done as early as Chapter 3, the ancient scrap of script-covered leather inside a realist laboratory, you can also delay it for Chapter 5 if you prefer, you can only craft it starting from Chapter 4, because the components, well, you won't have them before. As you need to show it to the storyteller like all storyteller relics to finally get it in a usable form. I'll be blunt, it's only really good for certain mythic paths. Other ones, it ranges from underwhelming to garbage, so... Here's the best ones. First demon. As it will empower the demonic aspects even above level 10. Second, we have the Aeon Path for massive party-wide bonuses. Third, Lich, once again for bonuses, this time for undead allies. And honestly, that's it. The other mythic paths, well, besides Angel, which can help you increase your spell damage for, let's say, Bolt and Storm of Justice. But anyways, the other mythics, don't really bother with it. You are much better off spending the materials to craft this on other useful storyteller relics. Such as, for example, the Shy Lily's Helmet. It grants the wearer a huge plus 4 profane bonus to strength and also plus 2 to AC. Profane bonuses are also extremely rare. I wouldn't really bother using this on the main character because if you accept Nocticulous Gift, you can get another nice profane bonus anyways, and it won't stack with the helmet. This is yet another storyteller relic that is crafted from the crumpled demon helmet item found in the upper city during chapter 4 only, so missable, because you won't be able to return there afterwards. It's at one of the rooftops, I already have a separate guide properly showing the location if you need. Don't forget the Call to Violence Cloak. This is especially useful for characters that have a Scald party member to provide rage to everyone, or is a demon, right? Because demons can also rage by default. But by the way, casters can also use the rage spell on allies if you want rage without having a Scald. Now, what makes this cloak so powerful is that first, it's a plus 4 resistance cloak to enhance your saving throws, but most importantly, it grants a massive aura which empowers all enraged allies with an untied plus 2 bonus to attack and damage rolls. As always, the higher your attack and damage, the better, right? Especially on hard and unfair. Very easy with a scald because everyone will be raging anyways from their song ability, which means everyone gets these bonuses. You can buy it from the Raggy Merchant, also at the flash markets. 
Now we have the Ring of Imminent Demise, which by the way is the best ring for any two-handed character. Whenever you make an attack of opportunity, the opponent must pass a Fortitude saving throw or be knocked down. The DC isn't really high for Chapter 4, but you know it's a free effect anyways, and if you are following my builds, your characters will be drowning the enemies in multiple attacks of opportunity per round. The best part comes now, as it grants a plus 2 competence bonus to attack and damage with two-handed weapons. Amusingly enough, it seems even as far as this patch, the competence bonus will stack with other sources, which makes it quite unique. You can buy it from the Merchant Kribus, also at the flash markets. Honestly, a lot of powerful Chapter 4 items are at the flash market, so just head there. Greater Quick and Meta Magic Rods are also extremely useful. I am only covering them here because one of these rods can only be found at Chapter 4 and is missable, once again, at the flash markets, at the Spell Merchant. Being able to quicken spells like Mass Heal, most importantly, can easily mean the difference between life and death. Now for the last great Chapter 4 item we have the Undying Love of the Hope Bringer Heavy Shield. What we really want is first Dark Aura. You just have to cast this from the shield to permanently activate it until rest. All enemies in a huge area will take a minus 2 penalty to initiative, good because you wanna act first. Second, all companions will get a plus 2 profane bonus, very rare, to attacks of opportunity and critical hit confirmation. Third, Whenever a companion lands a critical hit on the enemy, they must pass a will saving throw that this isn't the best, but you know, it's free because of how many attacks of opportunity you get, or be put under a sleeping effect. Lastly, and this is one of the best parts, all curses, poisons, diseases and here we go, mind affecting spells have their DC increased by 2, for both enemies and companions. It doesn't really matter if the enemies also get this boost, because at this point your whole party can easily become immune to mind affecting, the same cannot be said about the enemy, however. It has some other nice abilities too, but they don't really compare to Dark Aura. Well, alright, now finally let us get into the truly ultimate items of the game, that is, the ones you can find at Chapter 5. I want to start with the Hammer of Masterpiece. This is an amazing item, but it's only recently that I actually found out how good it is. It has two effects. We want the second one because the first will only apply to the wielder and we don't want to be attacking with this hammer, well, unless you are a build focusing to light hammers. Anyways, whenever you equip this hammer to any ally, you get a secondary ability here which lets you buff any party member, not just the wielder, three times per day. Each use lasts for one hour, which is more than enough for any dungeon in the game. The effect will be stronger depending on how many ring and talismans the character has equipped. If all three slots are equipped, they'll get a plus 3 circumstance bonus to attack and damage. By itself this is already great because circumstance bonuses are extremely rare. So essentially that's a plus 3 that will stack with anything else any character can get. Both attack and damage. So even at its weakest, the character will already get a plus 3 bonus to attack and damage. If they have 2 out of the 3 slots equipped, they'll get a plus 2 circumstance bonus and also an additional attack per round. Increases to attacks per round are also extremely rare, usually there is only the haste spell and some feats. Now if they only have 1 out of the 3 slots, they'll get a plus 1 bonus and 2 additional attacks per round, which is a massive increase for any character. You might be asking, well, Having only one out of two rings and one amulet is kind of a downside, well not really. It's going to depend on the character, but for some of your party members, for example the two ring slots you have aren't really that necessary. Most importantly, we have pets of course, and here's the best part. Pets, well they can't equip any rings, only an amulet, so by default you'll be able to buff your pets with the ultimate effect for free. So now our wolf, which is already busted good by default, has two extra main hand attacks, which means, well, more damage and of course more knockdowns. More chances of granting your party members extra attacks of opportunity too from the teamwork feats. The Hammer of Masterpiece is very easy to get to, it comes from Scylla's last personal quest during Chapter 5. For a second great Chapter 5 weapon we have Killing Pace, which is also the ultimate composite longbow in the whole game. 
It's a plus 5 speed weapon, but most importantly, it lets you add half your ranks in mobility as a competence bonus to damage on all attacks. Notice it says ranks here. You can only have a maximum of 20 ranks with any character for any skill. So in the end it's up to plus 10 bonus damage on all of your bow attacks. This is also part of why any bow character should consider increasing their mobility as they level up. Killing pace comes from the Skeletal Merchant, the same one you meet randomly during chapter 3 to 5 while traveling through the world map. For another amazing weapon we have Down Flower's Kiss, also the ultimate scimitar. It's plus 5, has holy, and whenever you get a critical hit, very easy because scimitars have the best critical range, you'll get a plus 4 bonus to attack rolls untyped, together with even an extra attack per round, what's not to love. Down Flowers comes from the Ineluctable Prison area during Chapter 5. You can either choose to corrupt it or cleanse it by talking to a certain ghost NPC in the same area. Fiery Spellweaver is a great pick for casters, as it grants you a very rare plus 1 bonus to caster level for all spells of all schools. Which means of course higher damage, higher buff duration, easier time getting 24 hour spells with Enduring more spell penetration and the staff even further boosts it by plus 4, but overall it's a way of getting higher spell damage, right? For uncapped spells, especially Chain Lightning, and of course the Mythic Angel and Lich spells. Be sure to combine it with the Robe of the Seven Sins I've just covered before, during Chapter 4. Now for the best glaive in the game we have Mutilated Angel. It's plus 5, and whenever you attack an evil creature pretty much everything, you'll get a massive plus 5 untyped bonus to all attack rolls, together with additional 1d12 slashing damage on hit. There's even more to this weapon, because whenever you land a hit, it also automatically debuffs the enemy's armor class by minus 1 per hit, stacking up to minus 5, without a save so it will always work against any enemy. It does have a penalty of reducing your charisma by minus 3, but this honestly doesn't really matter for most characters that want to wield glaives anyways including, let's say, clerics like Sociel, who already comes with Glaive proficiency for free. Mutilated Angel comes from one of the last bosses in the Treasure of the Midnight Isles DLC, during the last set of Isles, right before the final boss of the DLC. Before finishing our weapon section, I also want to cover the Peacemaker Hand Axe. I usually don't equip it in my builds, because it comes kinda late, at chapter 5 only, right? Anyways, it is a very stacked Hand Axe, Already has Evil Outsider Bane by default, plus 5, but most importantly, just like Grave Singer, it also has its critical range increased to 18 to 20, so 15 to 20 with improved critical, or even higher with a Trickster main character. The bonuses don't stop there, because whenever you get a critical hit, you also deny the enemy of their dexterity bonus to AC, which can be huge, for 3 rounds. Ideally, if you want to use this hand axe, well, First you want to get Grave Singer, but choose to craft it into another hand axe instead, so that you can later during chapter 5 dual wield it with Peacemaker, this way you have two hand axes with the best critical range possible, together with great critical damage as well for the complete package. Peacemaker comes from the Bone Hills area, while exploring the world map in chapter 5. As for the best rapier in the game we have the Translucent Needle of Astonishment, it's plus 5, Evil Outsider Bane 2, but most importantly, whenever it lands a first hit against a new enemy, that enemy has to pass a will saving throw quite respectable at DC 31, or become paralyzed for 2 rounds. The best part is, even if they save, they'll still be staggered for 1 round, which is quite crippling as well. So it is great for hard and unfair, because it does have a crippling effect, even if the enemy manages to save against it. The Needle of Astonishment comes from Camellia's last personal quest, if you choose to kill a certain NPC for her. For a nice shield we have Assertion of Dominance, also the ultimate heavy shield, mostly because of its amazing defensive capabilities. Assuming you are at full health, you'll get immunity, that's right, complete immunity to both slashing and piercing damage. Now remaining at full health isn't really hard, especially at this point in the game, you have a lot of ways of getting temporary hit points, for example, which are first reduced before getting into your actual hit points pool, together with multiple ways of healing your character and of course armor class, damage reduction, concealment effects and so on. 
This heavy shield comes from the ineluctable prison after you defeat the boss there. As far as a great armor, we have Snake Skin, which can provide you with a plus 4 profane bonus to dexterity. Just like the Web Strider armor, it's great for increasing your dexterity. But of course, also best left to ranged characters or other dexterity characters that don't care about AC because of the dexterity restriction here. I wouldn't bother with it for the main character, at least if you're focused on dexterity, because once again, you can just get a bonus to your highest score as Profane through Nocticulous Gift. You can get Snake Skin at the last set of islands for the Treasure of the Midnight Isles DLC. As for a great amulet, we have Voracious Spirit, also one of the best in the whole game. It has multiple effects, all of which can stack even for higher bonuses. Whenever the wearer kills an enemy, you'll get one of these effects here. Plus 10 to hit points for a maximum of 15, plus 1 bonus to AC untyped for a maximum of 5. Well, the other ones aren't as good, but fortitude and will saving throws too. Voracious Spirit comes at Camellia's last personal quest. As for the best tanking gloves in the game, we have Embroidered Gloves, which provide you with a very rare plus 3 luck bonus to AC, also to saving throws. Getting it is somewhat annoying, however, first because of how late game it is, but you need to do the secret area inside Arilus Laboratory. Darkness Caress, meanwhile, is the ultimate headband for any spellcaster, as it is perfection plus 8, meaning plus 8 to all of your mental stats. That's plus 2 higher than anything else. Also has a secondary property of letting your charisma be added to ranged weapons, so if you don't want to use it with a spellcaster, you can even have it on someone like, let's say, Aru, to make use of her high charisma and bow attacks. The major downside is how late it gets, only at the start of Threshold, the last area in the whole game, by just talking with Nocticula at the entrance. Now, Zaori's beauty can make for a very nice headband as well, because of its very unique property. It gives plus 6 to Charisma and Wisdom, which is nice. And there we go. The wearer and all allies in a 10-foot area will gain the effect of all of these teamwork feats here. Shielded Caster, Allied Spellcaster and Shield Wall. You mostly want this for the Allied Spellcaster feat, which increases your spell penetration for each nearby ally, meaning you'll have a very easy time bypassing the spell resistance of any enemy, even on unfair, by the time you get this headband anyways, even without a single feat spent into spell penetration. Plus, another great part is that it enhances everyone around you, right? It's not just the character equipped with the headband. All of your other nearby casters will also benefit from these feats for a higher spell penetration. Now, Zaori's beauty comes from a crusade relic at chapter 5, the base item being called Zaori's Pin. The Mangling Frenzy belt can be a nice addition too, especially if your character is focused on critical damage. It's a plus 4 belt of physical perfection, which is fine, but usually at this point you would want plus 6. In any case, its most important property is here. Whenever you deal a critical hit, your attacks will also deal an additional 4d6 slashing points of damage, which is quite respectable. Of course, you need to be raging for this to work, including Demonic Rage. So that's another benefit of having a Scald ally to make everyone rage, but of course, you can be a Barbarian other rage classes too. Now, because this extra damage is applied separately to your character, if you want to fully hit the enemy with it, be sure to combine it with the Bane of Spirit ring we covered before. Mangling Frenzy also comes rather late at the city of Is, in one of the houses you can explore there. As far as usable items, well, we can't forget the Grandmaster's Rod, which is of course the ultimate metamagic rod in the whole game. Up to three times per day, you can make any of your spells automatically maximized and also empowered. Three times per day, for the maximum damage possible, especially when you combine it with the bolster spell feat. It even lets you ignore the spell resistance of the enemy, and most importantly, magic immunity as well. The main benefit of this last part is hitting enemies that are immune to mind affecting with the illusion instant death spells, especially weird. For some strange reason, the rod works with weird, but it won't work with, let's say, enchantment spells like overwhelming presence. Not sure why, it's just how it goes. 
The Grandmaster's Rod can be found at the Bladesmith Workshop, also the same area for Finian's last quest. Jarsic Axe can be another fun item. Its benefits aren't that amazing or anything, right? But it essentially increases the damage of any of your attacks by an additional 1d4, Cold, Fire, Acid or Electricity. This is always in effect. Of course, because it's just minor elemental damage, you also want to always combine it with the Bane of Spirit Ring. Otherwise, most enemies at this point will just fully resist this. Jarsigax, the minor dragon familiar, comes from the Dragon Burial Ground. But you need to first go there during Chapter 3, which is when it first unlocks. After you finish it during Chapter 3, at Chapter 5 you'll get a message to go there again. Call of the Fiery Things is the ultimate rogue for fire-based damage casters. It will make all of your fire spells deal an additional 46 points of fire damage. There's a downside of minus 2 to AC, but it doesn't matter, you're a spellcaster anyways. Now the best part is, just like the Ring of Pyromania, this extra damage will proc per hit, which means a spell like Hellfire Ray, which hits 3 times per cast at max power, will deal 46 times 3 for even higher damage. This rope comes from the Fire of Baphomet Crusade Relic. Now, before finishing this guide, I absolutely must cover one of the ultimate items in the game, the Flawless Belt of Physical Perfection plus 8. It's definitely very overpowered. First, it grants you a plus 8 to all physical scores, strength, dexterity and constitution, but here's the really overpowered part. It actually doubles the critical range of whatever weapon you have, and this will stack with, let's say, Trickster Improved Critical, the normal Improved Critical feat too which is why my character here has 9 to 20 critical range. That's higher than anything you can get in the entire game. By default, without this belt, the highest you can get is 11 to 20, and that's with a trickster. If you want higher than that, the only way is through this belt. The only reason I don't cover this belt in pretty much almost all of my builds is because it's very tricky and kind of annoying to get. It will only spawn on a new run if and only if you defeat the special boss of the first DLC Inevitable Access, that is. It's an upgrade over Playful Darkness, I think it's called... Inevitable Darkness, yes, that's the name of the boss. It's the same as Playful Darkness, except even stronger. But by that point, it's kinda easier to defeat because, well, you'll be maximum level with maximum gear anyways, including the best DLC gear too. In any case, after that you have to also finish the DLC, and then upon starting a new run for the normal game, this belt will be unlocked, but it only comes after you defeat Playful Darkness, so during chapter 3, the earliest, at the end of it. Like I said, it's a bit tricky to get, but if you really want to go all out on your character for that tasty, insane critical range, this belt is the way to go. Now, just in case you're wondering about certain Shifter DLC items, like one of the ultimate new talisman belts and so on, Fear not, because I'll soon read a guide covering all of the best Shifter DLC items. Well, alright friends, so this was it for my best overall items in the whole game, chapter by chapter guide. If you found it useful, as always, please remember to like, subscribe and even consider becoming a channel member. I truly appreciate your support. Thank you for watching, and see you next time, friends.